Mm. <sighs> All right, we are live. Um, just okay, good. My stream is muted. All right, hi. We are the Beverly community right now. I don't think any of us are on video, so sorry for that. But we are the Beverly community. We're a uh, initiative to seek to encourage collaborative wisdom through dialogue. Each week we do a study group where we discuss things surrounding important ideas related to wisdom and seeking understanding and how to improve ourselves and our, our goals in life. Um, done many more of these types of conversations. You can check them all out at bevery.me as well as all our other links to things. And today we're going to be discussing John Verveke's uh, lecture eight from his Awakening from the Meaning Crisis series. Uh, this is on the topic of mindfulness and Buddhism. Uh, yeah. So I don't know if we want to go through a little in introduction from each of us, or at least just everyone who's here uh, say hi and say your name so that people recognize the voices. I'm John. Tyler. Uh, I guess I'm going to speak long enough for the voice to show up for sure. And I will be popping in and out. So I don't know what fidelity is required for people watching this and wondering what uh, masked characters are existing in the background, but here I am. So what is the problem? Like, is it not showing us? Oh, I think it shows it's our name fine. at least. Yeah, it's, it's, it's you know, when we're not fine. talking. Yeah, it'll show you your avatar and your name. Uh, Smith? Uh, to your introduction. You made it then. But, uh, yeah, it. but this week we'll be discussing Viveki's lecture eight. Right. Just, and Ben, you're not going to be. Uh, yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm not going to be participating. Uh, That's right. Yeah. Uh, okay. Hi. So this is for me. And uh, I'm joined in from India. And I'm looking forward to chatting with you guys all. All right. Awesome. All right. So I have my notes, but I don't know, maybe if uh, Tyler, you want to kind of go over the bigger picture aspects to this, uh, to, to this lecture and, and kind of the main takeaways. I mean, I have some of my main takeaways as well that I can get into if you want. Yeah. Well, maybe, maybe that's actually the way you phrase that. Maybe that's a good, um, starting point to, to discuss an element of, of some of the background work that Beverly does. So Beverly is not just a study group. It's also a collaborative effort between uh, what I would say is a very broad and deep talent stack of individuals who are interested in changing the world and who are interested in, in making sure that they do it in a, in, a, uh, in a proper way, let's say. Let's use that word, a proper way, an iterable way through time, a Piagetian sense, like an equilibrated game. So we have that going on in the background. And one of the elements of that is a discussion about what makes a good conversation group. And it seems that people kind of fall into these little niches, behaviors, um, preferences for the way they see the world, and they bring that to the conversation. So John is pointing out a preference that I happen to have, which is for looking at things, uh, looking at things from the big picture, from a broad view, a broad trying to incorporate relevant uh, facts and information across um, different modes of thought, different perspectives. It's a consilience kind of view. Um, yeah, and then so that's an element of one of the things that we're developing in the background that we'd like to bring forward in a lot of different communities and that we're bringing forward right now. So the broad picture of the Verveki lecture to actually do what John is requesting is um, discussing the development of the history of, of cognitive frameworks and how that has helped shape the world that we live within. Right? Not just the way in which we perceive it, but the manner in which we try to alter it. And that the two of those things are, uh, I don't know if they're neatly divisible, but divisible elements, um, the internal and the external of this process of making sense of the world and moving within it. All right? And, and Verveke has um, begun this lecture series by going historically through the, uh, let's say, the improvements or the, the elaborations on these various what he calls psychotechnologies or cognitive frameworks and tools that are developed to interact with the world. So right now we have moved through much of the early Western 
uh, thought of man, which is kind of foundational for Western uh, industrial civilization. And also um, now we're starting to touch on some of the Eastern aspects and how they may give us more insight or agree with some of the Western insights and what that can tell us about how the mind works. So that's the big picture. And right. Yeah. <laughs> so sorry about the background noise. I'll, I'll, I'll be sure to mute myself or, or uh, if you guys need to, you can mute me as well. If, if I, I, I Is that forget. Me? Am I um, my... Yeah, you have the power to mute me as well. No, no. He, oh, I mean, are it, you it was... background noise for me? No, I think it's from, from my end. Since oh, I, I'm, I'm not on the same, I'm, I'm not on the same setup uh, as I usually in for these meetings so things might be a little bit slower or a bit out of tune so uh just bear that in mind our audience. ability to our ability uh, to make sense and cohere is being impeded by the technological tools so it's almost exactly, yes. it's almost the case like if i were to speak much slower. So I, <laughs> internal technologies, right? So when you're talking to somebody who um, has the internal inability to express themselves at the rate that you're accustomed to, it develops a, um, a resistance, right? A kind of negative affect. Like, like mm -hmm. when you're talking Yeah, it kind of brings into mind uh, Sorry, it, it kind of brings into mind one of the popular examples that Verveke uses of like the nine dot problem, where just the way that you frame the problem uh, and the way that we perceive the problem as like, oh, this is a nine dots all in a square shape. It gives us that idea of a square. So while the cognitive framework or the technology that we use to look at the world, such as in a square shape, both helps us in a lot of ways, but can also hinder us. So while at the same time, we're using a technology to be able to speak across the world and different time zones and with, without having to yell super loudly, <laughs> uh, it, it, we're also impeded by that to a certain degree. Uh, I think we talked about that, this quite a bit last meeting, uh, especially brought up in regards to Twitter, where. Twitter has certain capabilities within itself that gives us the ability to do certain things while also giving us the limitation of uh, only only able to do things in a certain way. Yeah, so it's both like a to framework to expound upon a problem, but we're also limited through that framework that we're using. I feel like there's a good quote from Nietzsche about this, like every, every tool is a prison or so, something like that, but... Th that so, so, sort of that idea at least but yes just, just to be aware that that this is something that is what wait, what i feel like there's some latency issues going on here when <laughs> you didn't finish your, your thought there right <laughs> yeah i accidentally muted myself too soon at, uh, after <laughs> finishing <laughs> sorry uh, okay yeah so this is uh, Aryan too this is moving towards the notion of tool use itself and, and mm. to bring in a key concept, and we'll use the famous hammer example because it just works so well. Most people use the hammer. Um, the same is true for a pen. You can think of a pen. You swing the hammer, right? And, and there's a process that you're engaged in that has an expected result. And if you're engaged in that process and the expected result happens, there isn't any interrupt. Usually hammering is a, is a cyclic process that you repeat. It is a it's, a, it's a, it's a pattern. So you, you hammer the nail and then you finish, you move to the next one, right? That's just a process you go now. When you miss the nail and hit your thumb, you suddenly, boom, something has gone wrong. And the first thing that happens is you're no longer engaged in this process of hammering. And you're, when you were in that process, you weren't really cognizant of like the difference between your arm and the hammer you were a hammering thing, right? It's like, that was the, the whole thing. You, you had a point that you were aimed at and you had this process you were invoking and then 
the moment you become aware of all of the different aspects that are engaged in that is the moment when it goes wrong. So when you hit your thumb, you missed and you, you kind of back up just a minute and you say, wait a minute, what happened? What went wrong? And you have a division of subject and object and you start to analyze, right? I can see you unmuted. You wanted to say something. Go for it. No, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, just the shift from being in the phenomenological world as Peterson would use, uh, uh, use of uh, a character doing things. Uh, with like goals and actions and things like that versus and then once that say like script is interrupted that is when we enter into the world of objects of things there are uh, things absent from their their meaning or their purpose behind them exactly something um, has gone wrong right something has gone wrong and this is where we say oh I was using a tool, the hammer. Is it the tool's fault? Was it the tool that was wrong? Or is it me that's wrong? Did I miss the nail and hit my thumb? Or did the hammer cause me to miss the nail? So that right, right here in this moment, you have the capacity to alter the hammer to make it a better hammer or to alter yourself to make yourself a better hammerer. Now, this distinction, this division is extremely important, I think, in the development of what it is to be a subject and to acquire tools, acquire abilities within yourself to accomplish tasks in the world. Some people seem to be much more inclined to place the onus or, or the burden of, of good tool use in the object. And let's call that more like an extroverted approach to the world. And some people, I think, have much more of a preference to uh, converge internally and change themselves to the outside world. Now, this, this division between the two preferences, I think, is what neatly divides the West from the East in terms of the general strategies that they used to deal with the, the cognitive dissonance that comes from when you smash your thumb with a hammer, when the world no longer is what you thought it was. You either alter the tool, alter the external world, the objects. You build greater and bigger machines. You dig coal out of the ground and you make steam and, you, and you, you build a whole world that protects you from the dangers, right? You no longer hit yourself with a hammer because you built a robot that hammers for you. Or do you stop desiring to hammer things so much? <laughs> or do you focus on your capacities internally? Do you rearrange your internal neural structures and your internal musculature to make yourself a better hammerer. Right? That, that this is, this is the, the different direction that you can go in terms of change. And I think that's, that's a, a, a deep element that we're discussing in terms of psychotechnologies. Right. So you can either change the environment or the landscape, or you can change the agent, like who you are as a, uh, as an individual and like, what are your expectations with the, within that landscape as well? Uh, and, and yeah, that that's, uh, was the arena agent relationship is what uh, Verbeke brings up. So it, it's kind of interesting. There's almost like a fluidity there to both, um, both the, the arena and also to the agent within the arena that can occur. I wonder if it's like, depending upon the, resistance given by the arena like okay so say you're you're within a very resistant arena where it's you can't like change the substructure behind it in in that situation the agent is what is going to need to change because yeah. uh well i guess okay. it's yeah. less perfect, resistant perfect kind example. of like a uh, oh, oh wait sorry keep going huh oh, uh, sorry, keep going. Uh, yeah, yeah. I was just going to bring up kind of the, I, I wonder what would happen, though, like if you have an uh, a unstoppable force hitting a Im immovable object, if you can get that same kind of situation where you, like you have somebody completely uh, stubborn within their personality and how they view the world, and then put them into a situation in which they can't shape the world to fit their uh like their models that they have mentally. Uh, I wonder what, what, what happens in those instances. You make a new universe. I don't know. That, it, it, that could be the creation of a new Yeah, universe. like cognitive dissonance, I guess. 
Yeah, well, I think I think actually that sense is the development of the concept of or ties in with the concept of exaptation. In the presence of an immovable force and an unstoppable object, you have to find the third way. Right? You, you develop a new direction. I think this is also related to the three body problem in physics. It's, it's intractable from a mathematical standpoint, but it clearly happens. You know, three bodies must be colliding. <laughs> Uh, three concepts, three ideas, two ideas have to collide, and then some third thing comes out of it that wasn't quite the union of the two. This, um, yeah, so th this the, the picture that I have when you were saying, that what, is, what is it that causes that um, preference, either change the, the tool or not, is, is this is the scenario. Let's, let's imagine that you, uh, you, you have your hammer, you have your nails, you want to build a house, um, you, you move out of your, your parents' house in, uh, in Norway and, and you live in Norway just for the purpose of the, uh, the vision that I'm having here. And you go and move into the, the middle of a, of, a, of a valley of a mountain and you have snow-capped uh, mountains all around you. And you get down and you start hammering on your house. Right? And you notice that snow starts falling down the sides of the mountain, right? And, and you realize you're in danger of creating an avalanche. Now, the... The problem here is that there's a there's an energy being produced by the hammer that is reaching up and causing the snow to shake and fall loose. No amount of altering the angle of the hammer head or the ergonomic grip or like whether or not it's aerodynamic when you're swinging it will have any effect on that aspect of the environment, right? You can improve the capacity for the hammer to be a better hammer, a better tool. But there is an, another element of the situation that seems to dictate whether or not that tool is used at all, right? So no matter how, how um, inadequate I think my hammer shape is, the tool itself, there's something in the environment that lends itself to the notion that I can't alter the hammer at all without still confronting this problem. And I think in this case, what, you're, what you are left with is is only the internal space, right? When that is you confronting an immovable object. And, and so instead of considering yourself or the notion of hammering and building the house in the valley as the unstoppable force, you reframe your momentum. You readjust your trajectory a slight bit and you either leave the valley or you find a way to hammer without you know, these sonic acoustic problems, right? You, you, you make these alterations in the actual desires that you have in the first place. And I think that's the tension that allows that to happen. Right. Right. And, and I think that's kind of like one of the, the great um, benefits or, or utilities within like the Eastern mindfulness movement. And also like with Buddhism in general is the, uh, the, it, the drive to, Yeah, the, the ability to kind of reframe our cognitive um, tools that we have to suit a in, in a way that is not like painful, I guess, um, so that getting us to like want to change ourselves towards a different goal rather than sticking with our goal that is impossible. Uh, and I, yeah, I, I think that that's something that the East definitely has in spades over the west is while the west is very much in the to bring in verbeke's terminology uh the having mode um within e eastern mindfulness that's very much trying to return to the the being mode so just to i guess clarify those points is like when you're in the having uh mode of i guess perception of the world you look at things in regards to their resources and what, like, uh, once I attain this thing, I can achieve this goal that I have in mind. So, like, say I'm sick. Uh, so it, within the having mode, uh, I have, okay, so what, what can I do to stop being sick? Oh, I can take these certain cold medicines, things like that, that will achieve my end of not being sick through some sort of material resource that I can have it uh and, and utilize and like there's a way that you can look at people this way as well so like tyler is a person 
And if I want to, I guess, increase my social status, I can exploit Tyler's in insight and knowledge and wisdom to try to, uh, I guess, speak like him and, and get a, ha have this uh, appearance of knowledge when I speak to others using his kind of terminology or ways of going about things. That, that would be being in the having mode uh, of thinking about personal interactions. Uh, well, I'm not sure. I'm then, not sure adopting my language would help you in that regards. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> and then, okay. So for being mode uh, is very much more about like becoming or becoming better at something or like attaining virtue. Uh, so he brings in this difference between uh, like walking and practicing, where practicing is not something that you can do just by itself, whereas walking is something that you can do just by itself. Like walking is something that uh, I can just walk. Uh, but for practice, it's to practice something is to practice, like to practice in reference to something else. So like to practice playing chess is to intentionally going about um, behaviors that will increase your skill in that domain. So maybe I will to practice playing chess maybe is increase my uh, cognitive load or, or practice thinking multiple steps ahead in chess. Like you can do this like for individual things at a time that that's usually helpful is to take one specific aspect of playing chess that is necessary to be a champion or a master, uh, such as that ability to see multiple steps ahead, focus on that and practice, um, those steps so that you can become better at playing chess. But, but that is, of course, only one thing. So being mode can also be in reference to like gaining virtue. So uh, being courageous, maybe in order to be courageous, or you would have to practice the virtue of courage and in developing your character towards that end, uh, rather than it being just something, some sort of like action that you can do. And then, oh, now I'm courageous because I do X. Now I'm courageous. No, you have to kind of practice in such a way that it develops yourself into something that you weren't prior to uh, doing this thing. Yeah, in general, but, I think we can uh, generalize it to practices mm -hmm. of consumption and production. It's... Uh, uh, kind of like that. And there's a neutral aspect too. There's like an element when you, when you use his language regarding being right, that's, um, it's a very neutral aspect. somewhat. you can, you can just exist in the current state and not necessarily worry about what is coming in and what is going out. Um, but most of the time we are engaged in this other process where we're considering the other two options. Do I need to take something in? Do I need to consume? And that's that's across all of our senses, not just the you know the gastric system that we eat with, but also the consumptive capacity of our eyes, the consumptive capacity of our ears, touch. All of those things are sense data that comes and passes through our subjective little node. And anything that's passing through can be considered a kind of resource, right? It's the fuel that keeps that thing moving because if it weren't passing through, the system would fall apart. Uh, is the, the very act well, well i think the terminology that uh verveke uses it, of having and being it, is useful and, and i think uh just to i don't know maybe the being mode like because being is kind of uh i don't know vague and amalgamous like or not amalgamous but hard, hard to kind of pin down uh, i think what helps me understand it is he also uses it almost like becoming mode like uh your I guess that's actually a, uh, a distinction that's made in, in certain philosophies of being and becoming, where you have the world of ontology and then you have the world of like action and coming closer or lesser away from whatever is the ontology. I think that's a uh, Plato's usage actually. Uh, yeah, so no, maybe, maybe there's a. No, I, th I think that's, I think it's right, but I'm, I'm think so. Um, what is a human? I, I just wanted to point out, yeah, with consuming and uh, producing, there it, it still sort of leaves out the element of change in the individual. So by my consumption of a certain thing, 
uh, my the character of who I am now after that consumption changes compared to the consumption that occurred prior to that. Uh, same for the resource development. So uh, like <laughs> the person you are prior to having kids is very different from the person you are after having kids. Like the very act changes you in a way that might be left out if only looking at things in regards to resources of consuming and producing. Left out, would, oh, what uh, term do you think uh, has that contained within it? Uh, the, I guess the becoming an uh, element. So it, it seems like producing and consuming are both aspects of the having mode rather than the being mode or becoming mode. Right. Because yeah. it, mm -hmm. right. yeah. yeah. Okay. Yep, absolutely. Both um, aspects. Uh, well, okay. So what they do is depending on, I think, depending on the perspective that you take, the position that you're standing from when you look at them, alters what mode you exist within so um what is a, the question what is a human being okay well, the, the human being defined by me as a subjective experience is, is two things it's what i observe other human beings doing that's their production their output which becomes an input for me all right. So in that framework, when I look at others, human beings, I say, what is a human being? I then describe it as the behaviors of other human beings, the processes. That is a human being, their output. Right. And I'm doing it through the filter as it with the input filter that I already have inhered within me, which just so happens to also be human being. Right. And, and I can I can begin to examine externally if the output of those other products is properly human being or if my own outputs are properly human being or if the things that i am consuming are proper for a human being all of those things are elements of what it is to consider what it is to to be right and if those things don't match up if there is an element of discord between these things if the resources flowing through me are negative affects if the human beings around me act like animals, I start to call them cockroaches and pests and bugs. And I consider them no longer that thing, right? I can do the same internally, though. I can determine that my own behavior is like a roach, like a bug. And I can feel horrible about what I am as a human being. And that tension between how we build uh, elements up of what it is to be by looking out into the world and looking within is, is another element of the, the Western aspect of, of uh, well, so the, the tension between Plato and Aristotle, right? The ideal versus the amalgamation of, ex of experience, right? Do I see a hundred dogs and then average them out to a dog or is there an ideal dog? Yeah. Right. Okay, so I, let me see if I can get what you're saying there. The, there is this kind of interplay between the internal experience of myself as, an, as a, let's say, human being or as an experiencing thing, and then the relation of what I observe myself to be and how I observe others to be. Uh, and there can be a... Uh, like a... Dis uh, I, I can I can see others as separately from myself based upon how, say, they participate in behaviors that I do not myself participate in, or they seem to show some sort of malice intent that I myself don't see within myself. Um, and then, I guess, provi that provides some sort of way of otherizing them into something not worthy of moral consideration, just if, uh, for one aspect of that, I guess. Yeah, you remember being a kid and, um, well, I know you remember being a kid, but the element of growing up and being a kid, if you just watch children, they, they see something and they want it and they run to it and they grab it and then what do they say? Mine. That's mine. Mine, yeah. mine, 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 yeah. mine mind and this is the identity it's the development of identity of an external object and an internal desire and when those two things meet and their conformational process occurs and their hand is shaped on the object that's that heideggerian sense where the thing no longer is an object but now it is a subject it's mine 
And if it disappears, they cry. They've lost a part of themselves. And as you age, you, you learn to distinguish what elements you can grasp and let go of without crying. But we still go through this process all the time of determining what elements in the world around us we truly consider to be a part of what we are as a functioning being. If there's an element in the world that our process can attach itself to, whatever that process may be, the desire to eat, the desire to reproduce, anything, if, that, if there is a match in the world, a conformational match where we can feel like the pieces fit together, then we consider an element of our being. So light in the world was once considered an element of our being. If you go back and look at Plato and go back and look at Aristotle, the original conception of the way vision occurred in many cases was this notion that light was projected outwards from the eye and kind of returned. That there is um, there's this sense that anything which your eyes can gaze upon and that you can reach out and grab a hold of is yours. And you have to lose that element as you grow. But it's a, it's a key way in which we develop an identity internally and externally. Much of that is already bound up in the genetic structure that has been built by our ancestors and their past choices. And it's handed to us as a gift in the subjective experience of growing up as a child. But it's still this very real process of finding out a need or a desire internally that somehow matches with something outside. So in the case of a subjective experience in a social setting, um, if other people, like, let's say you're in a group of 10 other people, or let's say it's 10 people, you're a group of nine other people, you look out, if nine other people's output as a human being is all angry scowls and, and mean negative words, we develop this sense that they are not a part of us, that they're actively harming us. And I think that moment when it becomes a negative affect is when people start to define that thing as no longer part of them. It's when they draw the gap, they separate that gap and push it further and further. And the more harm a thing does to you, the less you can consider it like you, right? The more foreign it becomes. Hmm. Yeah, it's just bringing in like an interesting perspective on uh, like the very idea of property and property rights and things like that is tied within kind of the, the having mode and also just tied to ourselves as an identity. So like I have the idea of myself as an individuated person and I have these terms for things like my body. This is, these are my arms, my hands, my voice that's coming through. These are all mine because I have control over them. Uh, and like for somebody to use my body or, or my voice or my per personality in, in ways that I did not uh, agree with. That's like an, an imposition upon my rights and, and even upon my uh, identity that I have. Uh, that's why kind of like the deep fakes thing is kind of a kind of scary uh, thing arising within our technology that we have. Yeah, I cannot wait to see how crazy this gets, man. I mean, I can wait. I have to wait. But yeah, there there is some true insanity that's going to be playing out. Like it's, it's already beginning, right? But, but this this deep fake stuff, it, it really is like very quickly becoming hugely scary. All right. But all right. The, your point's great, right? So what is, who is <laughs> Stephen Hawking, right? What's his voice? What does his voice sound like? His voice. What voice does he identify with? That when he was younger, he had his own voice before ALS took it, right? He had his own voice. And later on, he replaced it with a robot voice. Now, after that, they developed technology sufficiently that they could return his voice to him, right? It was, it was a recording like this. But then they, it developed over time where he could actually choose to use a new voice. He could actually recreate through old recordings his old voice. They offered that to him for his little chair, but he didn't want it. He didn't want it. His voice was the robot voice that he had been using for years. That's what he identified with. I, I think that's fascinating. Right? And, and we can do that across uh, any object or any domain, it seems. People can want to be unicorns or Gs or jurors or whatever. They can, if there's an element of the external world that they can see or comprehend in any, or apprehend even, they can begin to develop some desire either desire to come closer to it or to consume it or to make it a part of their being 
or they desire to push away and to run away and to make to snuff it out to make it not a part of their being right uh and, and uh Berbeke actually brings in with the the story of siddhartha how the I, I, I guess kind of the transition away from having mode into the being mode or becoming mode. Uh, and he, like it, within the story itself, it's uh, presented through the idea of the palace. And it, it kind of made me think of like the Prince and the Pauper uh, storyline where you have two different problems that are kind of occurring for these two individuals. One where they have everything and the other way they have kind of nothing. And then they want to kind of switch that uh, as, and, and gain this new level that they didn't have before. But uh, as like Siddhartha learns in, in this story, as, and as Verveki brings up, the, the act of self-denial is still very much within the having mode, just as much as self-indulgence is. Uh, it's just a negation and still framed within kind of the same context and the same and framed in the same way of like, oh, you have some sort of problem. You need this in order to fix that. And so, like, if the problem is, say, death anxiety for Siddhartha or for a lot of people, then, oh, you have death anxiety. Here's what you need to do to be rid of that. Uh, you need to go through the act of stoicism or uh, aestheticism and, and you need to practice mindfulness, things like that. Uh, it's, it's still like framing the problem according to you have some sort of need and this is what you can achieve in order to, to satisfy that need rather than, I guess, the change in personality so that this aspect of reality, such as death, is something that can be accepted. I, I'm not sure. I like... For myself, it, the becoming mode or the being mode is very much more foreign to me, I think, than the having mode, which m might just be partially due from my Western cultural upbringing, but also, I don't know, just the way that just being able to see how much the having mode has been able to attain, like with technology and like what we're able to do here today, but also in a lot of other things. But uh, I, I guess think... there is still a lot of limitations to that. Uh, as we are also seeing here today with the very presence of the meaning crisis. Yeah, well, I think it's, I think it's an element of youth. Okay, so that the growing up requires consumption. Growing up, getting bigger is just an element of, of is you spend about 20 years with this sense that you're getting bigger, you're getting taller, people are looking at you and like they're somewhat shrinking and you're growing and uh, your mind is developing and all these things are changing in you. And, and there's a sense of that and it requires processes and engagement with the world. And much of it is undirected by your conscious experience. Much of it is just the, the past choices of your ancestors gifted to you as the momentum of, of life. But as you grow and you bump into resistances to all of those internal internalized, those lo local desires, you develop a sense of how you are different from the world. That is the actual development of your subjective experience. So, so much of what your ego is, much of what your self-identity seems to be, is uh, uh, the differences between what your past ancestors' successes were in their environments and how those are failing in your current environment. As those failures accrue, I think you start to develop a sense of identity which is associated with navigating the body through those failures to a better position. Right? That is how you develop your identity. So when you say, I am a fireman, right? you have tools and external environments that navigate you through the world to solve the problem of fire. And that's, that's true for any, in any identity. But I think it's an, it's an element of youth. It's an element of becoming. And then once you get to a certain spot, you stop feeling, it seems to be the case, like you stop feeling like you need to change the world. You stop feeling like you need to consume. You stop feeling like you need to even produce, I, I suppose. But all of those things can happen for various reasons, like depression, for instance, would be an element of someone feeling like they no longer have to produce or consume related to various reasons. But it's hmm. also a natural part of aging. 
right? So when you get to the age of 80 or 90 or whenever it happens to hit somebody, it could be 60 or 70 or that there, there is a decline in this feeling inside of, of the process of, of becoming. And it's now more like a process of being. And then it's, then it becomes more a process like becoming less <laughs> than something else. Right. So there's a, yeah, there's, there's something in that. Right. Kind of the transition over a, a person's life of they have to change the world because they see all the problems with it into uh, I have to become less so that the other aspects of the world can become more that maybe have right. greater capacities to do so. Kind of like the uh, the theory of the the evolution of um, uh, in, in, in grandmothers, the the evolution of like the loss of fertility. What is the term? Uh, menopause. Yep. Yeah. Menopause. Mm -hmm. There you go. Yeah, yeah, where it, it is genetically uh, more productive for them to lose their fertility abilities and instead put their resources into the the children that they already have at their uh, like uh, under their care. So that, like giving them, <laughs> feeding them, and caring for them, taking care of them, yeah, giving them things. That's one aspect of. I guess the gradual shift that happened. Yeah. And it's almost, so it's interesting because I think the healthy approach is an accrual of new identity while you are losing a sense of other identities. And that, that you can see it in the development of the words themselves, like in English or uh, Germanic um, compositional nouns here, grandmother, right? So you, you, you didn't necessarily lose motherhood. You've become something more than a mother. So th this, this is a, a kind of a positive emotional affect. It's a, I think it's an exaptation, right? You've lost something, the ability to reproduce um, uh, in the womb, let's say. But, but you now can reproduce good, good feelings, good environments for the growth of children, uh, wisdom from having lived through so many different experiences. All of that becomes your new identity. Now, if you don't acquire those new identities, I think, if, and just focus on the loss of reproductive status, it's a negative. It's, a, it's immediately in a negative affect. You, you're losing a sense of identity, but not building a new one. And I think it's an, an important element of, of maybe any process of a human being is if you are in an environment where your identity seems to be antithetical to the environment and you're losing grasp of that identity, you know, you, you, you should be building up another identity. You should be building up another set of uh, talent stacks right, to, to deal with the environment. Right. And, and just to bring in more Verveke terminology, it's like the identity is in regards to you being an agent on a in, inside of an arena. And there's a good mesh between who you identify as and what are your abilities within that game that you see that you're playing uh but that's the thing when you kind of lose like the i the model of what arena you're actually within and or losing your idea of what what you are as an agent within that arena so suppose like and that's when you become disenfranchised and you kind of that's when the meaning crisis kind of comes forth. And you can kind of think about this like in, in one aspect, like within democracy, if you're within a democracy of, or of say, say you're a Republican in a blue state, then the aspect of you being a, a voter is kind of marginalized and um, not something that you can place much expectation on. And so you might become somewhat disenfranchised with a political system within that, or, or you could put it the other way around. If you're a, a blue vote or in a red state, then your ability to actually affect change in the environment or like even enact your values within your environment is something that is limited for you. Uh, and, and so your, yeah, your identity cannot be based upon that without some serious like negative repercussions for you. Uh, yeah, so I, I, I think... Mm -hmm. yeah so 
I, I don't know. This at least is bringing forth a, a better understanding of what causes the meaning crisis to occur. Because he brings it up with Siddhartha of like Siddhartha had the expectation that all of reality was as simple as it is for a prince inside of a kingdom. But upon realizing, no, that there are things that can happen to you no matter what you have at your disposal uh, that are negative for you. It, it, it brings forward this new, new reality for him that he cannot comprehend or deal with from his own current situation. And so that kind of puts him onto a midlife crisis of sorts where he has to find out what is his purpose and what can he actually do in regards to these things? And is it the fact, is it a fact that you can't do anything about these things like death, sickness, and um, what was the third one? Uh, I guess sickness, oh, aging, sick, uh, sickness, aging, and death were the three examples of uh, the, the in, uh, like new things brought up to Siddhartha in the story. All right, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, that's great. I like it's um what if what if Ray Kurzweil was successful in becoming immortal, but it was only him. Like after he used this the first serum, it just didn't work anymore. Mm. You think yeah. Get, yeah, yeah, that would seriously change his uh salience aspect towards <laughs> why he thinks that's me. Yeah. Well, I I just I, I think the way that we portray the world, you know, some of these things are seen as problems um, because of the negative affect, right? And in the Western world, you want to solve the problem of death by making us immortal. And in the Eastern world, you want to solve the problem of death by uh, losing your anxiety towards death. Yeah, losing the anxiety, I but guess. also, I mean, there's a there's a mythological structure that portrays an afterlife that has a sense of progression too. But, um. But yeah, it is is very much related to down regulating the the negative emotions that prevent you from acting in the world based on that fear of death. Yeah, yeah, those 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 are I think will always be with us because they're 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 demonstrations of the way in which the two hemispheres two hemispheres in our mind function in the world. And so the large scale apparatuses in our culture are just uh, you know they're they're zoom effects of of the small scale apparatuses in our mind. There's something that uh, Verveke brought up in, in his retelling of uh, Siddhartha that I don't think I had heard from uh, the other retellings, like either from Peterson or also in my reading from Herman Hesse's book. I don't think it mentioned it, but that the fact that Siddhartha left his wife and child in order to go out on his kind of meaning crisis recovery or journey. Uh, that was something that, especially for, for us, it it's, uh, speaks to almost his immorality by doing so, because like there's an expectation that you have a wife and child, you have responsibilities towards them. But I mean, I guess the point of the story being that the these responsibilities that we have for others, like for a wife and child, are built upon this axiomatic assumption that there's that you you have to have some sort of meaning within your life like you have to understand your purpose and then from that understanding you can gain like these uh what is it Con contingent goal sets or, or or something like that where uh you have these responsibilities tied along with it so like uh, peterson brings up you 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 want to be a good person and nested within that is you want to be a good husband and then nested within that, you want to be a good father. You want to be uh, a, a good worker. You want to be a good um, know, accountant. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All, all these kind of games nested within this larger framework of having something to identify within. And I think that if you lose that kind of agent arena relationship there then all the other ones kind of fall short uh, or fall away as well and, and that's why yeah you you can i guess like a i don't know at least theoretically a society can collapse if it loses this grounding more 
it's not even grounding morality, but grounding meaning by which all morality is nested on top of. Yeah, and you start to develop a, you say the nested games are a sense of this stack of um, kind of primordial rules and then incremental or, or uh, like an accretion of rules over time. Um, and so it, uh, like the central notion of being a human being and you could stack on top of that the notion of being an American or as you say, a businessman or whatever, right? Father, all of those things. The question is, as you develop that stack, you know, you're labeling more and more nuanced rules for each little layer of interaction, the, the salience field for that interaction. So when I interact in the world as a father, it's either directly with my children uh, or with others as fathers, perhaps. But I don't have any element of my identity as a father in regards to the manner in which I open doors or mow a lawn or something like that. Uh, that that is a completely separate arena to, to use rake's language it's completely this separate arena and i think what what is meaningful in terms of the stack of games is when you have cross-contamination or antithetical rules between these stacks so if if being a human being requires that i be uh truthful and honest in order to keep playing that game uh that, that's a core belief, right? If I layer uh, my Americanness on top of that, and then and then I require Americans to be uh, like you know untruthful, I can no longer really consider myself a truthful human being if engaging at that American level, it kind of reaches down into that human being level and starts affecting it because the rule at that level was antithetical to another rule below it. As long as the rule system of the higher level doesn't interfere with the rule system of a lower level, I don't think you get a conflict. I think you can build further and further structures. But once you have an antithetical rule, it starts to dig down into your system and it starts to produce corruption. That, that's, that, that seems to be what happens in most cases. I've actually, um, I, I, I think of it as a three-dimensional Venn diagram. There's probably a name for that. Um, where you have overlapping layers of something like um, desires and duties. And if those, if those are antithetical to each other, you start to develop um, these different systems of thought. But yeah, so like if it's you and I, and we, if we were to list all of our desires and then draw a Venn diagram for that, Right, those desires which overlap, we can consider um, healthy desires for the development of, of whatever it is we consider our community to be, right? The John and Tyler community. Those things which don't overlap, right, and in fact are antithetical to the ones that do overlap, we start to consider elements of not the John Tyler identity community thing. And I think that's the process by which we go through. That's interesting because it, it, well, for two reasons. One is uh, that's kind of like what we're trying to do with the Beverly community, like our, just within house is finding where, what are our objectives that we have and what are the objectives that e each other have and see where do those, where can those converge and where do those not really converge, but we can still help other people uh, attain those things because that's also like one of our objectives is that the other people within this community can also achieve their objectives insofar as they're not like harmful to themselves or, or others just for as one example but I mean so far we haven't found any objectives that seem to be like that just yet um, and then okay what was the other reason uh, the, the convergence of uh, the goal sets that we have in mind and then the Venn diagram. Uh, I think I lost it. Uh, so I was describing those elements sorry. which overlap, bring us closer together and those elements which are competing or different. Um, we start to define as not part of our group. Right. That's right. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. And that reminded me of like the Aristotelian way of describing things where you can have like multiple teloses or multiple habits for an object. So like uh, within mammals, 
like there's a commonality between mammals where they give birth to live young, they breastfeed, uh, they generally have fur or hair, uh, they are warm-blooded. Those are like aspects of mammalhood. But no then feathers. you separate those things. No yeah, no feathers also. Uh, you can separate those things based upon their unique aspects. So say like for cats, cats are mammals and humans are mammals, but cats have a certain ability or capacity that humans do not have. So they have four feet, they have uh, these sharp canine teeth. Um, they, they are able to hunt birds without any tool usages. Uh, they, uh, yeah, they have a tail, <laughs> that's another thing. And so there's these unique aspects to cat hood that it is what separates them from the commonalities of mammalhood. And so it's almost like um, as humans, we might have our goal sets and our desires that, that are common among us. And then we can identify according to those. And then we'll have our unique aspects that might be only relevant to ourselves. So like somebody that's allergic to peanuts, they can't have peanuts, but for myself, that's not something that I need to worry about. Or for somebody that has grown up in a unhealthy uh, family situation, they might have like some past trauma that they'll need to recover from or deal with. That is kind of a something, it's not irrelevant to myself. Well, I guess it kind of is. It, it's something that is not something I, I need to care about or, or worry about unless except for, I don't know, helping others to do so. So it's these, yeah, we have our commonalities that which we can identify with. And then our, we have our individualities, which are the things that kind of make us unique and separate. Uh, similar to, you have the commonalities of mammalian uh, or mammals, <laughs> and, and then the specificities uh, of like the, the very species themselves. I guess that's the common uh, root word there uh, of the things that individuate them and to make them unique. That's why we, we, we can have things like categories even and, and be able to understand the things that fit within those categories or do not. Yep. And I, I'd say that's, I, that can be distilled to the notion of can your definition of identity be confined strictly within your own boundary? Or does it require the introduction of something outside yourself, another yeah. another object or a subject outside yourself? So my masculine identity as a male requires the notion of a female. Right? It requires the union of the two. That that those uh, those elements are inseparably bound. And so my development of the notion of masculinity is in relation to the resistance or the, the oppositional aspect of the development of the feminine in the world around me, or even within myself, if I start to get very union, right? But that, that is it. Is you, you define the aspects of who you are based on how it connects to the outside world. And then also another set, which you begin to create your self identity out of, which is those things which are different. So I'm, I belong to the class of males, which is the separate separation of difference from the class of females. Um, I belong to the class of males that are six feet tall, right? And then brown haired and eyes and, you know, all that. So it starts to narrow down into the individual uh, majority of one, minority of one or however you want to put it. It's just me. All those things which make me me. Right. And that kind of brings in, uh, like, there's the example of, uh, I guess, Plato, like he was trying to define a man according to some sort of definition of a, a flightless, featherless bird, uh, or, or, oh no, a flightless, featherless bipedal. Uh, and then uh, Diogenes, using that definition, plucked a chicken and then said, behold, Plato's man. <laughs> uh, so you can have a way in which you describe something, uh, such as the way Plato did for man, uh, and you... It, you can either have that definition being too vague that it brings in all these other things as well, such as uh, plucked chickens, uh, or you can have it 
too specific where it doesn't actually correspond with anything else. So like you might have this, sorry to pick on Marxism, but you can have a definition of Marxism where of something to do with like the, the system that shall bring about a utopian society post-capitalism. Uh, like maybe that could be part of your definition. But when you see, that just means that every other instance of Marxism put into practice that did not accomplish that goal wasn't actually true Marxism. And it was instead some sort of state capitalism or, uh, I don't know, uh, or, or authoritarian ca uh, communism or, or something like that, that is is a way that you can kind of get out of jail free card just by changing your the specificity of your uh, definition in sort of a no true Scotsman sort of way. But I, I don't know where to go from there exactly regarding. Uh, how about we go here? I don't think it is fair to criticize communism because Marx isn't here to defend it. <laughs> <laughs> because Marxism what? Isn't here to defend it. Um, oh. <laughs> do you think that's how a lot of people feel? Like, uh, you know, like, you remember that, um, what was that person who did leave Britney alone, leave Britney alone? Me. <laughs> leave Marx oh, yeah, alone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just wants everything to be good for people. Oh, I can see it. Yeah, that's, a, it's exactly right. And I think that's maybe a good generalized rule um, or a helpful psychotechnology perhaps to, to list the aspects of your identity which conflict with the aspects of identity that exist around you. And those things which do conflict are the places which you can bring this question. Do I change or do they change? Right, and then you do a kind of cost benefit analysis with some other aspects of, of, uh, of your life. It probably starts to get pretty nuanced from there, but yeah, that, that's, um, hmm. Yeah. And it brings into the, the, the same dialogue between Plato and Aristotle of like, you might have this uh, conceptualization of Marxism in the ideal. Uh, and then you have the like aggregation of Marxism laid out in practice uh like the people that called themselves marxists and then what were the say recurring uh results from those people that called themselves marxists and attempting to lay out a foundation with from within like a marxist framework like you can say that they weren't marxists because they diverged from certain things that marx laid out but it I mean, from their perspective, they were carrying Marx forward in ways that were unviable or non-viable when put into practice. So if Marxism only exists within the ideal and cannot actually be practiced despite all the attempts, then why are you advocating for it exactly? Or if Marxism is something that is only that which has occurred in the past, there's the, I guess, the other kind of end of the train there that it's, there's no way to expound upon it. Like uh, you, you can't try to convert Marxism into some sort of useful uh, way, such as maybe like with the Catholics and distributism. Uh, that's sort of a way to bring in the workers, having some sort of element of property over the the uh the corporation itself in some ways yeah uh, yeah there yeah to to uh to like, uh, or, or as in, in verbeke brought up in the example of siddhartha uh, you can have your bow with two tight of strings or, or like for your violin uh not your bow your, your, your violin can have two tightest strings and play uh, the incorrect tune or have it too loose uh, and play also incorrectly. Here's... I think your your mic might have switched again. Um, oh, did it? Just oh, okay. switched Sorry. rapidly there. It got pretty quiet, but I think you're right. It's just the right amount of tension to play just the right amount of note. 
And right. it's, it's that gap between the upper and lower bound and how specific you require that, that gap to be, how narrow or broad is based on your, your capacities to receive that signal. So human beings can only distinguish, they can only discriminate between say like 10 Hertz up to 20,000 Hertz, somewhere in that range in the, the audible area. And it, it has to occur in certain timings too. Above a certain tempo, you start to distinguish beats as a single tone, for instance. Um, and and that, that very limitation on the manner in which we can engage in the world fundamentally shapes the way in which we describe it. So if I hear uh, 500 beats per minute on a, on, a, on a metronome, it sounds like a continuous sound to me. And I would describe it that way, but someone with the capacity to discriminate further would say, no, I hear the individual beats. What are you talking about? Hmm. Right. Like if you're a hummingbird or a rabbit or something like that, you would probably hear the, it would, it, you wouldn't hear it as a continuous thing, but as individuated beats. Hmm. Right. Yep. Or a, or a field mouse. I think one of the um, fastest metabolisms is like a little mouse, a little, little field mouse, and it experiences the world at a rate. Oh, I think uh, there are a few moles that are like this too. It seems like their experience of the world is, is much more slow time than ours, right? They get to discriminate at these little chops. Yeah, and I think that aspect of it, which is, it's really, really very fascinating because your capacity to discriminate changes over time and you, you, you can improve it, right? As you, as you move into um, an unknown realm, as you move into chaos, as you look at the data, as it comes in, at first, it's just a sea of nonsense, but over time, you start to organize uh, using your own internal capacities, the information, and you start to discriminate on signals within the noise, and you start to make sense of it. And your own capacity to discriminate is a, a separate issue from the, the information that exists within the signal itself. Right? But both of those things can be altered, right? So if for instance, if I'm the one who's creating the signal in the first place, now it starts to get really weird. Now I've got a self-feedback loop. Now it's a closed cycle where the words that I'm speaking right now in real time are the production, and they're also the signal that I'm receiving and interpreting. And I'm listening at the same time that I'm speaking to determine if the words are true and to determine if they're real. And I have the capacity to interrupt myself, to interrupt the signal, interrupt the, the creation, to alter in real time. And that, that, that is what is so strange about living creatures, about the conscious experience, is, is that existing within the same thing. Right. And, and sometimes like we kind of do that with each other where like I'm doing an output and you're receiving that and then feeding back at, 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 to kind of I don't know, change me in a way like, and you can have a dialogue going, like a platonic dialogue, uh, of a, I don't know, achieving some sort of new result that was wasn't there beforehand. Whereas, um, and and you can also kind of do this a, as a person, like if you take the time to be mindful of your own thoughts and beliefs, and considering them, like in a kind of Cartesian way, I suppose would be one sort. Uh, I, I don't know, at, at least for myself, I find like b just by writing down my thoughts gives me a much greater clarity over them because after writing them down, I can read it back and I'm no longer in the, I guess, mode of output and, and more in the mode of input of like considering and testing even. Um, I don't know if, Submit, you wanted to add, add anything. I, I'm sure you... you you might have uh, plenty to speak on regarding this topic, maybe. Uh, well, I wanted to add a few things a uh, long time back, but uh, that topic has been changed now, and we are talking about something else. Uh, but whenever you guys need a, a change of topic, uh, just let me know, because something else also came up in my mind as I was listening to you guys. Do it. Yeah, yeah, go for it. We, we, we've uh, just been passing back and forth between the topics. Oh, no, don't do it, Sumit. Don't talk. Don't talk. Don't talk. 
kind of benefiting from reverse psychology and also positive psychology there? <laughs> I don't know. I'm waiting to see what happens. Oh, he listened. Dang it. Smith, you're not supposed to listen. <laughs> <laughs> There you go. There's the yeah, okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> let, it, let, let us have it. Okay. Um, so, what I was thinking was uh, that uh, there is a, uh, uh, if you have read that book, The Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, there is a, a phrase in it that that folks' character was trying to uh, define the world using. Uh, a to Z alphabets or something, and that got me thinking uh, that uh, isn't the language we use to describe the world. Uh, world also limits uh, us, limits what we can, you know, do uh, or what we can experience. For example, uh, Einstein uh, said that he used to think in terms of pictures. So, uh, would he have been able to come at the insight of relativity, right? If he was just uh, thinking in terms of language or like just thoughts, right? So how do you talk your way into traveling at the speed of light and then uh, do all that imaginative work? And uh, the reason I'm bringing this up is because uh, one thing uh, people say works as a hindrance uh, to being mindful is uh, the precisely the uh, thinking mind that we have, the speaking mind, it continuously is trying to analyze things and uh, people say that uh, to be mindful is to obviously that's not everyone's understanding of mindfulness i mean different people understand it in a different way but one thing people complain about is like why do we have all this uh, like monkey mind it keeps jumping here and there and how do i calm it down and uh, uh, what uh, what i thought was uh, imagine when uh, we were a civilization, right? Uh, where uh, we only had rudimentary language and not the full blown kind of language we have. And we haven't yet assigned the labels to the things uh, like we have now. So today, if I'm angry, right? Uh, I might say, you know, I'll break your nose, or uh, I might say that, oh, I'm angry, or I might say, how do I get back at this? person right but what if we didn't have such an elaborate language right so then in my opinion we would automatically be mindful in the sense that when i feel angry right so i would have nothing to do but to just feel that anger and uh, just experience it because i cannot verbalize it right and uh, so so that's the idea that occurred to me that maybe this uh, really sophisticated language that we all know and have kind of internalized so much that we find it really hard to look at anything without having a thought right uh so and yeah. uh, the more yeah. Yeah. Wait, sorry keep... uh, yeah go ahead but uh, no i was thinking of just ways to kind of take that abstract sense that you're talking about and and, and make it a little more concrete so if I'm talking with somebody across a table and they make me angry, like in your um, example, I have to react now, okay? And let's say I have tools on the table to help me react. On the left-hand side, I have a hammer. <laughs> Next to it, I have a pool noodle. You know what a pool noodle is? A little floaty toy. Uh, and next to that, I have a pair of boxing gloves. And, and then next to that, I have a Bible. Uh, next to that, I have a Siddhartha manual, right? I have all these options about things, that, tools that I can employ in my engagement with this anger reaction. Um, I think there is, there's a way that you can see this, you, you know, if you make it more abstract in terms of your internal choices, right? It's not a table in front of you that you have to choose from. It's the tools you have within you. Now, if you only have a hammer, in other words, if someone makes you angry and the only thing you've ever seen or the only thing you've ever known is that you can punch back when they make you angry, then that's what you do, right? That's like having the table in front of you and your only choice is a hammer. But if you have seen other people use dialogue, if you've seen them calm themselves down and calm another person down and say, 
let's actually talk about this because I think there's some difference between us that we can resolve without violence. If you've seen somebody do that, suddenly it's not just a hammer before you, but this other notion, this other set of tools, the psychotechnologies of, of the social interaction that you can employ. And I think that's a, that's a great point that your own capacity to interact in the world is based on what tools you think you have available to you, which ones you've seen and which ones you think you can handle. Right. And, and like, I, I don't know, I, I think about this in, in regards to like the animal kingdom where there actually are creatures like we just talked about with the, the field mouse who they're observation of the world is different from our own uh and like like the mantis strip as well they have i think 12 color rods while we only have what two or three uh and, and so like they have the capacity to experience many different types of colors that we ourselves can't and so it's like i don't know i i think we shouldn't have the expectation for things that cannot be achieved uh such as like I shouldn't expect a human to know the difference between uh, these two colors that they don't have the ability to see the difference between. But I mean, I can have that same expectation for a mantis strip. And I think we kind of have that same thing for, for other people. So like um, if, if I interact with somebody and I know that they know a certain thing, uh, but they still choose to, like, let's say like for, for Tyler, I, I know he has an understanding of the Bible uh, and a behavior set associated with that, but I see him acting out in ways that differ from that behavior set. I might have a greater expectation for him to follow along with his identity uh, of being a Christian and, and point these out to him. Whereas for somebody that had no bearing or understanding of the Bible uh, or, or really care or identity with, with that aspect at all. Uh, I, I should have no expectation for them to behave in such a way that I would expect from somebody like Tyler or, or somebody else that I might know more personally, even. Uh, That's a great it, point, like, John. And mm -hmm. I really appreciate when you help encourage me to build my arc. Um, it's it's hard it's difficult i don't have a lot of room in my backyard but <laughs> <laughs> so uh i appreciate that thank you but yeah and, and what you were saying tyler too is like these these behaviors they these tools that we use in reaction to our uh, our environment are based upon how viable these tools have been in our past. Like it might be the case that the only way to get the type of response that they're wanting is through violence or, or aggressive language. And so that becomes the most adequate tool usage for that person or for that environment even. Like if you go to New York City, you have to build up this stubborn attitude towards others or else you'll be the victim of grifters and anybody that has a uh, more stubborn attitude than yourself. Like you can't be very, like you can't be too agreeable in, in a dangerous environment like that. So you have to build up this resilience. And I think that that's partially why we have to build up our social communities is I, I know that say Tyler has certain skills that he's more specialized at, that he's more capable of utilizing uh, in response to um, the uh, in response to the environment that uh, is best for that. Okay, so like, say Tyler's ability to go into the dual aspect of many different things with the or the the dichotomous aspect of the the hemispheres. Like that is something that is a tool that Tyler has very well secured within his tool belt and something that he he's able to use for a lot of different problems out there now uh and yeah for somebody else that doesn't have that same tool uh, i shouldn't expect them to be able to think about that in such a way like it might be that they have this kind of monolithic worldview where like their own perspective is the only thing that's correct and so maybe i should have 
a I should dialogue with them from within their own perspectives because they don't have such an ability. It, it, anyway, I was just pointing out that by having multiple people, each with their own individualized and specific skill sets, uh, we can we can utilize these behaviors and tools that we've each kind of built up for each other uh, or built up for ourselves, uh, even in, in, even in response to novel and uh, foreign problems that are arising. Heck yeah. If we work together, we can build pyramids or we can blow up asteroids with nuclear bombs before they destroy us all, or we can fly to the moon or we can have a good conversation or I can determine that anybody who's different than me deserves absolutely nothing and they should all die. Those are just completely opposite ends of, of the possibility spectrum, but they both exist. You have Dylan Roof on one end who hurts so badly and thinks the environment is so wrong that he wants to wipe the whole environment off the face of the earth. Or you have this cooperative element where we realize that there are problems and capacities that exist outside of our ego, outside of our bounded little body, and that if we engage with others, not just human beings, by the way, also dogs, I can go into the woods with a dog and survive better with a dog than without one, right? Right. Emotional comfort, uh, all sorts of things. You, you get it. So that, that element of it only requires at the very beginning that I not um, destroy something because it is different. That's, that's all that requires because once you do that, you're done. Right? You destroy something because it's different. You, you've got no capacity to move beyond what you yourself are. And if you recognize that you yourself are inadequate to the needs of the, the cosmos as a whole, like how long can you go? 60 years, 70 years? What if we do develop immortality? Are you going to live a thousand years on your own? Right? What, what happens when the, the garble blargs from you know, Alpha Centauri show up and, and they want to do battle? Uh, they, what happens when the, the asteroid shows up? It doesn't matter how intelligent you are or how immortal you are um, genetically. Right? There are elements of the world that require cooperation between these uh, subjective bounded states. Right? I guess just the story of life, right? Human beings are now capable of dealing with asteroids, whereas whatever pre-human mammalian creature you want to consider in terms of evolutionary space would never have been able to. All right, Samit, did you want to, I don't know. <laughs> okay. Uh, so I feel like I wasn't able to articulate what I was saying. Uh, so I'll be more concrete now. So uh, imagine uh, going through any experience without using language. Uh, just tell, view yourself this exercise, right? Uh, so next time, uh, like, when you're walking around or doing whatever activity you're doing, right? Try to do it without using language. So uh, in my opinion, you'll automatically be mindful. You will automatically uh, experience uh, the reality and be in touch with uh, it because uh, you're not getting carried away uh, in your uh, thinking. Uh, another uh, example I can give you is uh, when, when I look at a object, right? Uh, a thought doesn't necessarily occur to me. Uh, so it might or it might not occur to me. For example, if I look at this uh, pen over here, uh, I'm not thinking anything. I'm just looking at the pen. I'm just observing it, right? But uh, when I look at the text, uh, for example, the English text, right? Uh, so I can't help but verbalize it in my own mind and read it, right? And uh, try to uh, try to read it, uh, try to look at the text without actually reading it. Just look at the shape of the whole thing, the whole word, then zoom out, look at the whole sentence, and then look at the whole paragraph without reading it. Uh, that's another exercise uh, I've been trying to do. And again, the reason I'm doing it is because uh, language is a very important tool. Uh, but I have noticed that uh, if you don't uh, if you kind of decide not to use language then you have nothing uh, much left but to kind of experience uh, the reality and kind of be more touch with it so that that's the point i was making 
I I get it now. Yeah, I, I kind of stepped over that too when I started developing the analogy of the table and the tools on it. But I, it was to speak to that exact idea that um, the tools dictate the manner in which you interact with the world. So you, you bring up the, the visualization capacity of Einstein and how he, he dealt with physics problems and mathematical problems in general. And, and if you talk with mathematic, mathematicians, they will tell you that um, that the capacity to visualize is extraordinarily important when you're developing higher mathematical theorems, um, when you're trying to understand things. Uh, it's just very helpful and, and necessary for a lot of things. So that tool, the ability to visualize, is related to capacities in the brain, the wetware, the hardware, right? How it visualizes the world and how it manipulates sense data within that model. So let's let's do that. Let's do it right now. Because because I, I experience this somewhat against my will. I, I actually visualize things far more often than I ever verbalize them internally in my own internal system. So to speak with you here is a very foreign um, experience for me when I when I move into the external world. Normally when I'm thinking on my own, it's just it's not words like this. So let's consider a statement. Trampolines are dangerous. This is a, this is a, a linguistic structure. I have now told you a piece of information, data, trampolines. You have an image of what a trampoline is in your head that you pull up perhaps, or maybe not, but you've seen one in the past and you can associate a word with it. Trampoline is bad or dangerous or whatever, right? Trampolines are dangerous, that's what I said. Um, and you said dangerous to who? Dangerous to human beings? Dangerous to kids? You start to, to fill in the gaps, let's say. Well, what is he talking about, dangerous? Now I can do this visually. What does a trampoline do? No words. I'm not going to use any words. I'm now visualizing what trampolines do. And I'm visualizing what could potentially happen on a trampoline that would make it dangerous. I'm, in, I'm visualizing myself bouncing and being off step just a little bit, flying up 20 feet in the air and landing on the ground and snapping my neck. I, I, and I don't have to visualize, I don't have to verbalize this any further for me to realize at, at that exact moment trampolines are dangerous, right? There is an immediate apprehension of, of meaning, which isn't verbalized. It's a different tool set. It's a different perspective. So I, I think sometimes, all right, but let me, let me bring this in because you say that this will help with mindfulness. And I think that's absolutely true. So it, that's usually in terms of a balancing issue. People who have highly verbal brains inside that have this running dialogue constantly, um, I think the mindfulness aspect they're usually employing is a balancing act. They're reducing that activity in the brain, the verbal activity, and employing other regions of the brain that are either not being employed enough to be satisfied. It's kind of like the shadow element of your, your, your personality that isn't getting its daylight, perhaps. Or you are failing to interact with the world, and that very real disconnect is causing you to recognize you need to employ other tools. And uh, yeah, so I, I think you can do the same with visualization. So for instance, when I ask myself this question, are trampolines dangerous? I, I can experience very much something called non-mindfulness <laughs> where I start to visualize a hundred different scenarios where I can go wrong on the trampoline. I did this as a kid, right? There's a trampoline next door to my great grandmother's. The uh, kids had it right next to a pool and they also had it right next to a picket fence with sharp pointy stakes. Okay. And so when I looked at that trampoline, I said to myself, hmm, what are the potential outcomes of a missed jump? Right. And I did that so many times that I prevented myself from jumping on that trampoline. And then that was a, a, a very real feeling of non mindfulness, right? Um, the anxiety associated with that. So I'm not sure it can be tied directly to just the competition between the visualization space and the verbal space. But I think in lots of places, it has to do with the balancing act between those two. So I actually feel much better when I do get to verbalize the visual images that I have internally, because there's an element of my brain that apparently does like to verbalize. It does like to explain in these linguistic structures the truths I discover using other tools. Uh, no, maybe visualization example I gave was uh exact not exactly lined with like what I, what I was saying um okay and you're right um maybe I'm a mostly verbal person so uh, I'm not able to um I couldn't see like uh 
uh, the visual for someone like you who is uh, more visual uh, even visualization would uh, uh, pose uh, an equivalent uh, kind of threat uh, and now that i realize uh, uh, how i mean how limiting uh, like my verbal uh, what do you call it a verbal personality or verbal what's the term for it uh, uh, the tendency to think of terms of uh, what uh, tendency is great i was going to say preference but tendency is perfect right? a tendency to think in terms of uh, words or language uh, rather than uh, visualization because uh, like you're saying right uh, uh, i think it does take away your uh, imagination right so if uh, if i say trampling is dangerous so a person like uh, me wouldn't visualize it he will just say oh trampolines are dangerous so but if you can visualize it that's uh, much much more information in my opinion uh, uh, and uh, you can't always do that kind of uh, processing in your brain all the time. Uh, so in my opinion, text kind of makes it easier because then it's, uh, you just have to interpret it and it's less, less involved or uh, do you, uh, but uh, someone, someone like yourself who is more visual, right? You don't feel that way or do you? Like, would it be easier for you to just read that trampolines are dangerous and uh, rather than having to imagine how they are dangerous. So the former would be simpler for you, right? Sorry, what was that last, what was the question? Uh, okay, so the question was, uh, uh, what I'm thinking is uh, like, uh, Language is an ex kind of uh, a tool that allows you to skip the imagination part and uh, yeah. mm -hmm. and compress a lot of visual information into just uh, text, like trampolines are dangerous. So uh, it would be much more work for, uh, for me to kind of imagine how they are dangerous and all that. So if you can just tell me that they are dangerous, I'm good to go. So. Do you also feel the same way? Do you also find it easier that uh, text is more simpler way of uh, dealing with things uh, than imagination is? Or you are so uh, used to imagination that you just find it easier in terms of visual imagination uh, and the way uh, you process things? Yeah, my preference is definitely visually um, to imagine things for sure. But what you're pointing out is great. Um, okay, so you know the phrase, a picture is worth a thousand words, right? Uh, this idea is kind of opposed to what you just pointed out, that it's easier to deal with words than pictures, right? You can say that trampoline is dangerous without having to provide or extrapolate on that theme by providing images and concepts over those hundred different scenarios. And, and here's what's interesting about this. It has to do with if it's good enough, Right. So if you tell me the trampoline, trampoline is dangerous, I can believe you directly. I can say, aha, I believe submit. He, he knows what dangerous is. He knows what trampolines are. I've, I've heard him say things before and he was right about those things. Aha, I believe submit. Trampolines are dangerous. I don't need to go any further. But if I am an, uh, um, an acrobat, or a gymnast or something like that, I, I, would, I would say, wait a minute, wait a minute. Trampolines are dangerous. Okay, how am I going to be able to use a trampoline then? And, and right this moment, I have to develop nuance. And in this moment of nuance, I, when I question this, this moment of questioning, where you, you give me those words, now I have to employ other tools. And it's this moment of employing other tools where I unpack that comment and it's like a whole hierarchy of knowledge exists underneath it right? When I unpack it, I, I start to agree with submit. Oh, you know what? He's right. Most of the broken bones that happen with children under the age of 15, when they enter the ER, are stated as due to, you know, trampoline, right? This is a great thing that he didn't package in the original statement, trampolines are dangerous, but which I have discovered using all sorts of visual cues and other exploration. So th this is, this is a great, um, 
this is true. This is true for everything, right? So when I want to use a proper word, a particular word, not just a phrase, but even a particular word, if the word is insufficient, I, I develop nuance and I create new words. I either find another word that is similar to it, but adds more meaning, which is the nuance, or I make new words, brand new words by sh shoving others together or manipulating old ones. I make a new word. And that, um, that has underneath it a mountain of meaning that you never grasp unless you have to question it, unless you distrust it. Right? That is why I have problems. So, with building, uh, have, uh, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead, Samir. Uh, this is, uh, okay, so th I'm realizing it, uh, you know, after talking to Tyler that uh, uh, language is just useful tool, but uh, it's also really hard to deal with now for me uh, because uh, uh, in the normal everyday uh, um, life, it's very useful. But when I'm reading uh, a book, uh, so I have to find out the exact sense in which uh, author is using that word. And obviously, that's uh, known to anyone who reads, uh, but uh, sometimes I, uh, I now remember that uh, sometimes you would have a footnote uh, from uh, someone uh, else who has, uh, who's explaining the work to you that in 1700s, you know, this word meant something else. So you also have to get the cultural context of what you're trying to read. And that's cool. Uh, yeah. So, uh, so another thing, uh, uh, you know, uh, I wanted to clarify was that uh, uh, the way I was saying, right? So if you are a very verbal person, uh, using language can be a hindrance to being mindful. Uh, and for uh, someone like Tyler, visualization can be, but that's just uh, something for the beginners because uh, uh, the meditation I was taught uh, didn't make uh, such distinctions. It's just that, uh, I, I find it as a usual, useful tool or a useful exercise uh, in order to kind of practice my skills. But uh, ultimately I was told that you can be uh, kind of try to be mindful about anything in the sense that uh, your mind could be thinking uh, whatever it is uh, it is thinking and uh, it could be visualizing whatever it is that it is visualizing and you could still observe that. So you get this split. Uh, it uh, it slid. Uh, I can't describe it to you, uh, uh, John or Tyler, uh, really, uh, because uh, how do you describe it? Like, uh, kind of, you are thinking, and at the same at the same time, just observing that you are thinking, and the thinking aspect of your mind is, you know, going on a, a big long journey, and uh, you are just sitting there and looking at it. Uh, it's something uh, so uh, like, as you get more and more experience, uh, language shouldn't get in your way. Uh, so, yes, yeah, so that's all. So, so that's all. okay. So uh, I wanna try and get, I, I, I wanna try to articulate your original question that it seemed like you were having. So you brought up how for Einstein, he had this visual capacity to think about relativity. But there's kind of like with, within that, the question of like, okay, if, or, or the assumption that if Einstein did not have that visual capacity, he would not have been able to uh, achieve his theory of relativity because that was the very way in which he, he came to that. So the question it seemed like you, you were getting at is for, for people that, don't have this specific capacity within them, is it possible to translate the, the thing that is known, such as say like the theory of relativity to the, in a way, it, despite their, their, their lacking, their, their missing aspect within they, that they have. So, like, you can I, think about this on an extreme uh, example. I'm sorry to stop you. Uh, uh, 
but uh, the thing is that uh, uh, here is here is where i created a communication blunder <laughs> right uh, so uh, <laughs> the, the idea originally came from uh, the motorcycle book i was reading and uh, it came up in that uh, context and eventually i connected it to mindfulness uh, uh, so right so the mindfulness part i already discussed with tyler and even i i, I think i even confused tyler but uh, the point that uh, you bring up now uh, please continue because i think that's also an important point and uh, that was part of my original realization uh, that i actually wasn't discussing but it's good that you picked up on it but just want to clarify that uh, was not related to mindfulness point well i i mean we, it would probably be better to stick within the mindfulness topic then because that that's kind of the 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 uh, theme of verbicki's lecture is to do with mining mindfulness and uh yeah so there was the example that he brought forward of like you can't exactly just force somebody to concentrate onto a thing just by like yelling at them or telling them to do a certain thing and i think he brings in that's kind of like how a lot of westerners go about trying to be mindful is by like okay focus on your breath focus on your breath focus on your breath, focus on your breath uh, something like that or try not to pay attention to anything it's something that just by having this kind of attitude it's hard to attain because it's it's making it, it's I don't know it's it's like a forceful command, but it's a command that does it that almost like distracts you from being able to do so. So like <laughs> there's this uh, somebody I follow on Twitter, and in his Twitter bio he has "Don't read this." So like that's the command that he's put forward, and it's impossible to kind of for uh, a lot of Westerners trying to get into mindfulness is that by that we're kind of getting in the way of our own ability to be in the moment in the present moment. Um, so yeah, if we can get outside of that. Well, uh, Verbeke himself kind of brings in a different way to do that same thing. So instead of focus on his finger, uh, focus on the finger, focus on the finger, he brings forward aspects and details to the finger that make it unique and interesting and engaging to focus on so it's almost like it's bringing forward secondary components rather almost like more specific components of the finger itself that make focusing on it easier to do rather than just kind of this vague abstraction of focus on the finger it gives you a reason to focus on the finger because like in order to notice the details of the fingerprint you have to already be focusing on the finger itself kind of like what tyler and i were mentioning earlier you have these kind of nested uh abstractions and then like from within them they're nested uh, or they're resting on top of these this other aspect so in order to say be better at mindfulness you have to have the capacity to focus on something specific and then in order to focus you have to yeah bring bring to light these specific details and engage with them as if they are interesting and salient to you. And then by doing so, that that gives you a better ability to be in the present moment and focus on things um, just by like becoming better at this skill rather than just I don't know, doing this certain thing like walking, uh, but actually being better at being able to recognize it. I don't think that noble skill that is hard to uh, hard to work through for a while. Um, I, I can move on to another note I have, I guess. I just need to switch over to the right tab. Um, so, oh. Uh, there was this other aspect that Verveki brings in that I think actually might clarify some of what uh, we were discussing earlier, where you're kind of stuck with these too specific or too vague 
definitions and categories for things. So like just the, the category of Marxism as something that only exists within the ideal and doesn't actually exist in practice. Uh, or uh, the definition of Marxism that is defined by histor its historical presence and cannot be updated to suit the new environments that's there. Um, so uh, it, Verbeke brings in the, let me see, where is it? It was at, oh, uh, like around 41 minutes in. He brings in, what are the, like, what is the purpose for being mindful? What is, what is mindfulness? What is the like feature list to mindfulness? Uh, and he brings in how this is like the eidos to mindfulness, which is like the, uh, the structural framework or its function, the, the, the function of the thing itself. And so he gives four examples. Uh, to be mindful is to be present, is to be non-judgmental, it's to give you some sort of insight, and it also helps you to reduce your reactivity to things. So like automatically responding just through habit or uh, addiction or, or whatever it is that was kind of not being reactive to something. So like being slapped in the face and responding with a punch, so something like that would be being re reactive. And so mindfulness is supposed to help uh, help you to not be so reactive to those sorts of things without considering them and being aware of what you're doing. Because a lot of times our reactivity to things is damaging to ourselves and others. Um, so the first two things, being present and being non-judgmental, non are states that you can kind of enter. Uh, and you can like be aware when you're being present in the moment or when you're not being present. Uh, and, and like, there's this, we can be inside or outside of this state. Uh, same for being judgmental, having like, enter, you're including your moral preconceptions about a thing, uh, or you're not doing so. Uh, but for the other two, insight and reactivity, these are both like results that might be achieved uh, from the practice of mindfulness. So, okay, the the reason I brought that up was to clarify, it seems like a way in which we can get categorical descriptions of things that are actually valid and useful for us. So if you define, say, the, the term mindfulness, according to these four functions, then we can get a good understanding of when somebody is being mindful or not based upon the the ability for that person to take part in, in, in these four functions. So you can say somebody is mindful because they are non-judgmental. They are always very present in the moment. They, they're able to gain insights that others don't have, aren't able to get at. And they're not, re, they're not just simply reacting to things like without thought. And uh, so that that is a way in which you could consider somebody is mindful because because they share in these features about mindfulness that we've set forward of descriptions. Um, and, and yeah, the, they're able to accomplish these better than other things are. So like, say, if you're trying to say that a, a chicken is quite mindful, uh, but it d doesn't have the ability to gain insights or uh, not respond simply reactive, reactively to things, then it, it would be less mindful or, or it wouldn't be a very apt description of the chicken or whoever you wanted to describe because it doesn't share it in these same function lists or feature lists uh, of mindfulness. Um, yeah, I actually need to go grab a plug. So I will be right back. Is, is Tyler here or, or Summit? I don't know if one of you... Hey, John, I'm here. No? Hey, oh. John, I'm here. <laughs> okay. Yeah. If you want to speak for a bit, I, I need to go grab a plug for my laptop. Is that all right? Ah, uh, that's all right. Ah, uh, that's all right. Okay. Hey, Tyler, are you there? He's probably dealing with his kids. 
don't know if you want to share maybe some experience you've had with mindfulness to the audience while I go grab a cord. That'd be good. Oh, or uh, meditation. Uh, okay, so I can uh, try to do that. Okay, so mindfulness. Actually, I have done two meditation retreats uh, over the past two years. Uh, and uh, each one was for 10 days. And uh, for 10 days, we meditated for about uh, 10 to uh, 12, between 10 to kind of 12 or 13 hours every day. And uh, it was the same uh, meditation technique that uh, John Vaveki also uh, teaches, it's called uh, Vipassana. And uh, the, uh, the first time I didn't uh, really understand uh, it uh, properly, but uh, the, the second time I got a little bit more insight into it. And uh, uh, who knows, maybe the, when I go there for the third time, I'll, I'll, get, uh, I'll get even uh, uh, more uh, insights. So uh, again, uh, so, and uh, it's uh, difficult to like, it's the same problem of language. It's uh, difficult to put it to uh, words, uh, right? And, uh, right. Uh, but I did notice uh, that uh, by the time I came back, uh, right? So my uh, capacity to uh, like look at my emotions and uh, uh, not react had kind of increased uh, significantly. Uh, hey, John, are you back? Uh, hey, John, are you back? Yeah. Okay. So yeah, that, that's great. Like being able going through that that practice actually did have the uh, the uh, results of you having these greater abilities or uh, a, a greater closer approximation to the, these things just as an indication that you've kind of gone through that becoming process rather than just a having process of like only experiencing it for that moment, but you're cultivating virtue and character for yourself. Uh, yeah. Uh, that's my, uh, actually I had uh, developed increased uh, resilience uh, from uh, addiction also, right? Uh, so uh, the idea was to, Again, it, it sounds so simple and uh, like I almost don't want to say it because I, I feel like it has been said enough times. Uh, so you just observe whatever it is that is coming. Uh, the reason I don't want like talking about it is because uh, I can say it, but it doesn't really help you. Like if I said that next time you become angry, like just observe the anger and uh, not react, then... I guess it wouldn't work for you. Uh, you just have to do the practice and uh, slowly, slowly your ability to deal with those things kind of uh, uh, increases and uh, that's when you have the change. And it's a constant practice. And it's a, uh, it's it's almost like, uh, you know how, how they say diminished returns. So uh, if I meditate for 30 minutes, right? So. I'm, I'm probably only meditating for like one minute in those 30 minutes uh, because that's how like active the mind is. Uh, so it goes somewhere, you have to bring it back. So if, if you accumulate all the times that you are meditating, it might just be one minute, right? Uh, kind, of, uh, kind of sounds like, uh, mm -hmm. I mean, the success ratio is really low, right? Uh, but uh, uh, like you are taught not to look at things that way and just persist on it. And yeah, right, it does have it does have its benefits. Yeah, and, and I think that's something else that is like really useful with there being like a, a temple with um, like the Buddhist priests and, and the, it's developing. Well, it, it, it's like the structure that helps people to actually put these 
this way of thinking into practice rather than like, oh, I read a book on how to meditate. You're actually there with people. And so there's this incentive program or, or incentive situation that you're within of, or it's not even just an incentive situation. It's like a limiting factor. Like there's nothing else for you to do except for practicing meditation. Uh, and, and so like it gives you the system there to actually follow through with uh, all these things that you know to be good for you and to go on these meditation retreats. And it, it, it yeah, it's something that you gain much more so from doing rather than just like reading about. And that's something Verveki brings in is like, there's a clear difference between training for something or explaining something. So like I could explain the aspects of meditation, but, uh, and then there's the way in which I could like tell you how to visualize yourself on a cloud and there's nothing else around you or something like that. That would be me giving you a, a it's it's not really an explanation i mean it's it's similar in that i'm like giving you a an idea to think around but it's done for a different purpose like i'm not telling you to visualize yourself on the cloud so that you i don't know understand meditation better but actually to give you a vehicle in which you can you can meditate better so that was something verveki brings up in the lecture is that when we don't have this clear distinction between um, which mode we're referring to things as, um, we'll have the, this modal confusion. So in order to, like, if, if we, as long, whenever we can to be clear of whether we are ex explaining something or attempting to train something. So like do something towards some sort of end that we have, like say, Okay, so say I had, um, I was a football player on, on, on the field, and the coach could give me a pep talk for, all right, think about yourself like you're the only person in the world, you and your team. There's no audience there. There's nothing else that matters except for you catching the ball and running it into the end zone. That's him doing a sort of training method, but he's not explaining, like, the rules of the game of football to me. He's explaining... Uh, or he, he's, yeah, he, he's trying to cultivate that identity of football player with, within me. And I think, yeah, that's something that we always do a lot of the time too. Well, I don't know, maybe if it's not all the time, but it, it, it's, I don't know, at, at least with this lecture, it gives me a, a new way of thinking about like, okay, is, is this an explanation or a training method that's going on right now? Are they attempting to get something through this dialogue that is occurring here? And, and if so, what is it that they are attempting to get? And do I, gr do I agree with that goal set that they have in mind so I can, um, uh, I, I can participate and accept the kind of like story that they're telling me? So it might be the case, I think we brought up last meeting that if you're interacting with a salesman, they're in kind of this training mode of, or not, it's not really training, but it's like a pragmatic mode of ach achieving an end where they want to get a sale out of you. And so they are going to speak to you in such a way that might be factual, uh, but it is also being factual towards an end. Like the way that they speak to you uh, will be attempting to get you more towards what they're trying to sell rather than what other people are trying to sell. So yeah, just being able to keep that in mind of like when people are being, yeah, there needs to be some sort of like good term for it of, I guess, manipulate. It's not so bad as manipulative, but I mean, in some ways, like the somebody who's teaching you or training you how to meditate is manipulating more towards somebody that, uh, it is better at the skill of being mindful and being present, things like that. But it's a manipulation that you agree with and are accepting. But yeah, um, I can go on with my notes if you'd like. Let's see. 
Uh, oh, yes. Yeah, we can so, uh, yeah, we can okay, yeah, yeah. By asking and answering the questions of the connectedness and relationships between the states, uh, do we start to gain a structural functioning of the thing? It's idos. Oh, yeah. So, so you can describe like the mindfulness as I did with the, or, or as Verveke did with the four like features of mindfulness. But that doesn't give you a very clear understanding of the practice of mindfulness. But when you explain it in regards to the, I guess, kind of like the cause and effect or how the, the relations between the thing. So like by being present, you gain a, what is it? Uh, by being present, you gain better insight or, and you're not reacting as reactively as you might when you're not being present. Um, this is kind of coming into, it's clarifying the connection there between the being present and the, uh, the end result that is achieved, the, the, the function of being present with the result that it has. Um, and, and that's the idos of the thing, the, or it's kind of like the, yeah, the, the function, the commonality amongst all things that is shared, uh, that I guess helps you to clarify the difference between when you, when this is actually the thing that you're referencing or when it's not the thing that you're referencing, whether it has this same structural function to it. And also your ability to recreate this thing. So because I have the understanding of like what causes me to gain better insight and be less reactive by being present or paying clear attention to where I am in the here and now, this gives me a, a, a more full idos of what it means to uh, be less reactive and to be more insightful. Um, I don't know. It, it seems like I'm kind of trailing off and spinning in circles a little bit. Um, but I mean, this is most of my notes actually from the lecture. And I think we had a, a pretty good conversation. Is there something else you wanted to bring up, Summit? I see had a look through the last bits of my notes, see if there's anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but something came up at home, so I may need yeah. to go. But something came up at home, so I may need to go. Oh, you, you have to go? Uh, not not for long, just for like uh, five, six minutes. Not for long, just for like oh. five, six minutes. Uh, okay. But it's, but it's a tricky situation. Well, so um, you are not. Sure. Okay. Well, uh, since hey. Tyler's not here either. Where, where are we at? Are oh, we there at? he is. Okay. Where, where are we at? Where are we going? Yeah. Uh, Summit has to leave for like five or six minutes. Uh, and I was just going through the last bits of my notes. Let's see if I can. Uh, Sumit went over some of his practices in the, um, the meditation retreat that he went on, and, and we spoke a bit about that, uh, and how these structures that we have, like these Buddhism temples and, and uh, monasteries, things like that, these are better platforms for actually achieving the end of mindfulness or, or meditative, meditative uh, practices than even just like a book is because like you can read a book and gain kind of a understanding of a thing but by actually putting it into practice do you actually achieve that thing more so than uh, just hearing about it you know but I think yeah, you got a phone call there's an element of this discussion I'd like to bring in and I, I'm not well versed in this yet but I'm really just starting to explore it is polyvagal theory and that has the um, built within it this notion that you can enact embodied changes that then feed back into the system and create the emotional uh, structure attached to the, those um, behaviors if they weren't present before so, so let me if you're unhappy you can smile and become happy now, everybody kind of experiences this. You can force yourself to improve your mood by forcing yourself to smile and forcing yourself to engage with people in a positive affect. 
this this actually encourages the development internally of the state that was prior lacking and, and so that's very interesting right so breathing alone whatever meditative practice you're using let's say you're doing it incorrectly let's say you're you're doing the whole Western notion of trying too hard to focus on your breath and that that is that keeps preventing your mind from relaxing to the state that most people are describing when they talk about meditation. But you are actually breathing out slower than you are breathing in and you're changing the pH of your blood slightly. And that is having an alteration on the biochemical balance. And that is in turn having an alteration on your, your peripheral nervous system and an alteration on your vagus nerve. And an alteration on your mind so these these elements are at play sometimes even against our best attempts to mess it up and I, I think um this this physiological element to the manner in which we engage with the world is largely hidden right it's largely an underlying layer that we don't approach but at this point in our understanding we can incorporate through cognitive science as Reiki is doing and through neurology and biology, these deeper understandings of, of how, in fact, these processes are taking place. And it's not always the, the necessity. It's not, not always necessary that we have this true conception of the process in our mind. It, it seems also the case that our bodies can kind of carry out these activities um, without even the proper guidance of our mind. If they were even proper guidance of our mind. So polyvagal theory, is that what you had mentioned earlier in the chat of, of Yeah. Mm -hmm. You Yeah. Okay. It's funny because Verveki in uh, his latest Q and A, he was asked a question about that. And he actually brought in how I guess that idea of circling in polyvagal theory was uh, had a um, a good deal of inspiration from Heidegger. Uh, which we've also talked about. And I guess in his one of his last lectures that he was actually filming uh, recently uh, went into Heidegger and its and his relation to, I guess, the, the meaning crisis and all that. So, it's, uh, yeah, it's something that we'll have to oh, look, look further into. As yeah, you... I, I don't have too much time right now, actually. I probably have to step out. But, um, yeah, I'd absolutely need to get into that. Yeah, oh. I'd absolutely need to get into Mm -hmm. All right, we might I don't know, just wrap it up soon because I actually <laughs> have to leave as well. And I don't know, maybe uh, submit since he said that he had some questions that he wanted to go into. Maybe we'll do this more into a uh, part two thing later at the end because that seems to kind of fit with for Reiki's structure is that you, at the beginning of each of his next uh, lectures, he kind of goes into a bit of wrapping up of the uh, last stuff or, or or recapping so hopefully uh submit can write down his questions and and we can discuss them further uh, later on but yeah it seems like each of us have to go pr pretty soon so um i'll wrap things up then um yes okay this is where the part of the Be Bevery network uh, if you guys want to participate in any of these dialogues or conversations, we actually seem to have a couple like during the week uh, just in our Discord chat. So if you want to speak with us or interact with us there, uh, it's all at beverly.me. So you can go there. That has all of our links, such as our forums, our YouTube channel. Uh, I think our Twitter should be on there, but also our Discord. So, um, yeah, yeah, I don't know. You want to say anything, uh, Tyler? Don't use Twitter. Don't use Twitter. Uh, I disavow that. <laughs> I mean, in certain ways, yeah. I mean, I'm currently on my fast, and I'm realizing just how hard it is to actually uh, keep from using Twitter after having developed such a habit of it for so long. Um, there's... There's certain functions that are unique to Twitter that cannot be be achieved otherwise. So, mm -hmm. and I think like certain my, of those like functions are usable. That is certainly one function that does seem to result from the hyperactive use of. Twitter. Yeah, so. that's just my perspective. Just my perspective. Take it with the. Uh, uh, yeah. mm -hmm. 
Yep. Yep. And I don't know. I do want to bring up that at least uh, Submit and several other participants in these types of conversations have only happened due to the usage of Twitter. So that's another end that can be achieved through the higher functions of Twitter. Are you saying you want to have an actual dialogue about the value of Twitter? I think we've had a couple now, actually. We had it with uh, a a good one that we had was with the um, Jack Dorsey uh, debate. That was actually probably the closest we've had to a debate on this channel, actually. Yeah, and and I guess I'm just at the point where I have concluded (laughs) that Twitter is is, um, more bad than good. And it's not necessarily utilitarian argument, but... I'm convinced by the weight of the evidence. Right. Is Submit back? I thought I saw him. Uh... Hey, yeah, I'm back. Are there? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, All right. I, I, Both. I, I... Uh-huh. Yeah, Submit. So both Tyler and I are going to be having to leave soon. But if you want to, if you want to go through your uh, questions, we we can try to go through those before we do. I think we, we've got enough time for that. Uh, no, I, I was listening to you guys. I think both of you wanted to uh, go because you have things to do. And you uh, said we can do that in the next lecture. Right, right. All right, so that works for you then? Yeah. All right, then I will end the stream. Goodbye, all. Um, yeah. Cheerio.